Anytime I talk about food waste, people make the assumption that it's the grocery stores and the restaurants that are wasting food. Restaurants typically are very good about food waste because they can't afford to be wasting food. The largest percentage, I think it's around 30 to 40%, is in consumer homes. And when you really do think about it, it's so easy to waste food. I love the like mint color on you. Thank it's fantastic. You. This is vintage. I've been making an effort in the last couple of years to buy entirely vintage when I want to shop because I love to shop. So that's been my whole uh my whole thing and I've been enjoying it. I love it. Yeah, I um I have a hard time making vintage fit my body because I'm a I'm a curvy girl and so it's difficult. So it's like I'm good with jackets. Like jackets are the the fun thing that like I can fit into those. And so yeah, I found some really cool pieces recently. Actually, the the jean jacket I am photographed in, in on my book and that I have worn like all of the time I found at a flea market in L.A. So oh, I'm obsessed with that. Always yeah. like, and you find vintage jackets and I find they're just so much higher quality often than yep. what is made today, which is the best feeling. Cause you're like, wow, this is 30 years old, but it looks brand new. Totally. Well, and then you get to say when, you know, when you're on a podcast, yes. and somebody goes, where's your jacket? You get to be like, I'm sorry, you're never going to be able to find it again. <laughs> I love it so much. I am thrilled to have you on the show. I was telling you this before, but like, honestly, I'm always excited to have guests on the show, but you in particular, I'm just like, food is such a love for me. And a lot of people don't know that because obviously my platform's not about it, but like, I love cooking. I love getting scrappy. I love all of the parts about food that just bring people together and allow us to just have really incredible memories. So I would love to talk to you about how you got started. You started this blog back in 2016. You were vegan. So prior to becoming vegan, you mentioned you didn't really have a lot of cooking skills. So what was it like to basically like deep dive into this like very niche cooking process? And was part of your blog this idea of like creating resources that maybe you didn't have access to? Exactly. And it's funny you mentioned your love for food because I'm the exact same way. I've always been a huge foodie, just obsessed with food. But my college friends now laugh their heads off because I was the girl that came into like our dorm room and stocked a freezer full of tater tots and mini pizzas. Like I did not know how to cook. And I also was not at all concerned about health. And it wasn't until 2015, the World Health Organization came out with this breaking news that red and processed meat were now classed as group two and group one carcinogens. And my dad actually is a colon cancer survivor. So he had colon cancer when I was growing up, when I was 11 years old, went through chemo, uh, surgery, very kind of traumatic experience. And then nobody mentioned diet at the time, which was so interesting now reflecting back because we just continued eating what I would describe as the standard American diet. And up until that point, I had never had a fully plant-based meal in my entire life. So that news was kind of like, okay, there might be an association here between diet and specifically colon cancer. And I went to school for journalism. So I'm very much a research type of person. So I started doing a lot of research, watching some documentaries and was like, okay, I'm going to try this plant-based thing. And I was lucky that my parents were also on board at the time. They kind of shifted to a plant predominant diet, I would say, with me. Although I was working up in Northern Ontario, lived in a 500 square foot apartment by myself, and I was working as a morning radio host. So I was like on my own, still on the tater tot diet and had to teach myself to cook from scratch. So what I will say is that the great thing about cooking with plants is that the stakes are very low. You're not so concerned about kind of your chicken and the salmonella and undercooking. Really, you make like a super stew with plants. You add too much salt, you add some broth, you can fix it. So that's what I learned very quickly is that cooking with plants, the stakes are lower and it can be a lot of fun. And I think just this journalism background that I had, I was really intrigued about the idea of being able to share about my journey and kind of the pitfalls that I was having and the meals that I was cooking. So that's how Plant You was all born. I just started sharing on Instagram. And I went on godaddy.com and was like, what words can I make with plant? 
and plant you was available on a domain and Instagram. And that's how that was born. <laughs> Very similar to my story at her first 100K. It was supposed to be your first 100K and somebody else owned the domain. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I had a friend in a bar in New Orleans who was like, have you thought about her first 100K? And I just hadn't because I was so laser focused on it has to be this. And then bought the domain and it was very similar. It was like, is it available? Great. I'm buying it for 20 bucks in a random bar. So that's so perfect, though. Like, I'm so I, glad I agree. It's, it's even first 100K. It's so much I think better. it's even better than your yeah. first 100K, but like, wasn't even thinking about it. So your transition from full time job to plant you happened in 2019. We get asked a lot of like, what does that process look like? Like, I've told my own story. We've told stories of other entrepreneurs, but it was same thing for me. 2019 was when I decided to take it full time. What was that process like for you? When was the moment where you're like, okay, it's time? So I had now moved back closer to home and I was working in marketing for a hospital foundation. So all the hospitals in Canada have foundations that raise money for hospital equipment. And I was basically like telling patient stories, helping to fundraise and really loved the job, had a pension, the whole bit, thought I would be there for the rest of my life, to be honest. And then Plant You was slowly gaining steam. I think at the time I had about 100,000 followers. I felt very passionate about it. And I started thinking a lot about how I could monetize it. And I eventually landed on launching a subscription service. So it was a $7.99 per month subscription service where people would get PDF meal plans that were just meal ideas. I was not saying like, eat exactly this. They were just like some dinner ideas for the week that were plant-based. Launched it and quite quickly that outpaced what I was making at the hospital. Although it, there was still this like, huge risk and my parents were like don't do it wait until you're on maternity leave one day and make the jump then but i felt really inclined and i was very fortunate i mean this comes from a huge position of privilege i had at the time i was living with my now husband i think he was my boyfriend or fiance one of the two at the time and he was really like i'll back you if if things go south i've got you and then also i just kind of was confident that if i took the jump I could always find a job. I, I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm working here now. I can probably get a similar job if things don't go well. So I had saved up a little nest egg, don't know how much at the time, and took the jump. And then three months later, I got a DM from a literary agent in New York, who thank goodness was a trustworthy person because I was very much like, somebody's interested in doing a cookbook with me. I'll... <laughs> I'll do anything. I'll take anything. Um, she was amazing. So she helped me craft a proposal. And then I signed my first cookbook deal probably six months after I had left my job. And that was really the start of when things started taking off. But I don't know if you'll remember this, Tori. Um, do you remember when Instagram was just photos, not video? Oh, yeah. It's hard to remember. But yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a painful time. And I feel like that shift happened around 2019. And prior to that, I had just been posting infographic photos that are like my cookbook. It had um, like ingredients on the top and then the finished dish on the bottom. And I remember vividly when suddenly the Instagram algorithm switched and these photos were not doing well anymore for me. And before that time, people really didn't know who I was. My platform, people would think I was a man. Like they, they were, it was basically faceless. And then I had to switch gears and start making video. But I'm so glad I did because it created such a deeper connection with my audience. But that was all happening around the same time. So I left my job and now I'm like, wait, my current routine of what I do is post like one photo a day is now like, you have to post a video every day. So it was a lot. But if if I have any advice for anybody, it would be to make sure you're making money before you leave. I don't know if you agree. No, I completely agree. I've talked a lot about on the show about I think there's two kinds of entrepreneurs. There's the leap and the net will appear who actually like need that motivation uh, and a little bit of panic to like figure their shit out. I am not that person. I am, I need a duck and then another duck and another duck in the row and I need a net and a net and a backup net. So I, I do think that there is flexibility building something on the side if you do have the, the, the ability to do that because 
um, we always like to acknowledge here that side hustle is just a fancy word for second job. A lot of people actually need a second job because they need the money. But for me, and it sounds like you, that side hustle was, you know, something that was a passion, eventually a play for entrepreneurship. It also gives you flexibility to, you know, make concrete decisions about your business that might feel risky if you're dependent on it for income. Um, I think one of the mistakes I see people make is they they just ask their business to do too much too early. Um, and then you become resentful of the business and it's just so hard to ask it to pay your rent when it's not ready to pay your rent. So yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, you wanna have that space to be investing in the business, right? So if you are just using every cent and dollar that you're now making to live, that's going to be very difficult to scale anything. So if you have the ability to be working at night, which you've made a excellent point that that takes privilege, I think in and of itself, um, that's the way I would go about it again. I, I was still nervous. I remember that day I left my job and I sat in my car and I was like, oh, what did I just do? But I mean, it worked out for both of us. I had the same experience. And I, yeah, I'm realizing I love I love this moment on the podcast where we have guests on who I don't know a lot about personally. And then it was the same thing for me. My parents were like, this is don't quit your job. Take your you need to do everything you can to keep your job. And I'm like, yeah, I'm OK. We're going we're to see if this works. Um, One of my favorite things about your platform, and of course, we'll talk about scrappy cooking in a little bit, but it's your content is like one part eat more veggies here's how we could do that and one part how to not waste the food that you've already bought and the food that's in your kitchen where did your awareness of just how bad food waste is where did that begin it really started from the plant-based angle so one of my main motivations for staying vegan for a lack of better term was that the environment i learned about the environmental implications of animal agriculture and i think a study was done a few years ago that showed if you as an individual want to reduce your environmental impact one of the most powerful ways you can do that is by reducing the amount of animal products you eat so that was really interesting to me and i was like okay this is this really aligns with the world that i want to see because in my opinion when i reflect on the life that i want to lead it's really important and I, I can imagine that you're very mission driven, but it's really important to me that I live my life for the world that I want to see. So then after I had published my first cookbook and had kind of really encouraged people to eat a lot of plants, I just heard the statistic that stopped me in my tracks. And that was that 30 to 40% of all the food produced in the United States ends up in landfills. And my immediate thought process here when I heard that was, okay, the food decomposes, it's fine. But actually what happens is it builds up in landfills and as it decomposes, it emits methane gas. And that is very bad for global warming. And additionally, it actually creates more emissions than the airline industry, which is astonishing because I feel like in school, if we were ever talking about climate change, had everything to do with transportation and maybe you're taking too long of showers, right? So for, for us to never be talking about the food on our plate was just really shocking to me. So as a food blogger myself, I still waste food. And back then I was certainly wasting food just because I was recipe testing so much. So I, I started to take an audit and really practice kind of what I preached in my own home by trying to be really intentional about the ingredients I was buying and reducing food. And then one day on a whim, I just threw up a orange peel candy recipe. I called it scrappy cooking. Really, again, not much thought was put into this put the video up, put my phone down as I do when I post a video because I'm like, oh goodness, what is going to be the reaction to this one? Walked away, came back an hour later, and it had been viewed a million times, had so much engagement, and I was like, wow, people care about this. And that's what kind of struck in my head, this is this is something, this, this is something nobody is talking about, needs to be talked about. And not only is it going to help people and the world reduce their food waste, but it will help people save money. Because when we think about the price of groceries, it just, it's astonishing to me that pe we throw food out. I know how it happens, but groceries are just so expensive these days. 
Yeah. And not to mention, you know, that we live in a society where there are plenty of people going to bed without enough food at night. And we're, you know, there's food deserts in the United States, not to mention other countries. And so, yeah, I mean, this is a clearly a multi, multi, you know, if you peel back the onions, there's more layers here to this problem of, yeah, it's a climate change issue. It's a financial issue, both personal and an economic issue. And then it's also, yeah, when you hear a stat like that, where it's almost half of the food's going to waste, and the amount of people going to bed hungry, like that's, it's crazy. Yeah, it, it's, it's senseless. And you know, what's really interesting about this. Anytime I talk about food waste, people make the assumption that it's the grocery stores and the restaurants that are wasting food. Restaurants typically are very good about food waste because they can't afford to be wasting food. The largest percentage, I think it's around 30 to 40% is in consumer homes. And when you really do think about it, it's so easy to waste food. I think we're in such a culture where we're go, go, go. I find it myself. I, I barely have time to plan meals for the week. And you head to the grocery store and you have all these good intentions. You're grabbing food off the shelf. Maybe you have a family and you get home. And then at the end of the week, the food has gone bad because you maybe got takeout or something happened that week. So it happens a lot easier than we think. And I do not want to blame consumers again. Um, I am no perfect person by even the scrappy a person doesn't right. still has food waste. It's it's just about if we can do our best, I think we'll all benefit from it. Yeah. And I don't want to open the, the go in the rabbit hole of like, you know, the classic version of like the most of climate change is coming from like 50 corporations. Yes. Yeah, so it's exactly. like, what, what can you do as an individual? Like, I, I, I'm the same way where, you know, obviously I'm budget conscious. Like, I'm your budget girl. I also, you know, love food. But there are, uh, my my partner could come in here right now and tell you how much food ends up getting wasted accidentally just because it gets buried at the back of the fridge. I forget about it. I, yeah, to your point, go to the grocery store and I have every intention on eating out and, or, you know, cooking in. And then I end up, yeah, oh, it's, I have a bunch of events that I forgot about where I'm going to get dinner before or after. And yeah, it's the same thing. So, before we talk about like specific recipes, just in like shopping or how you set up your refrigerator, like what can we be doing? And I'm really asking, what can I be doing to make sure that like I cut down on the food waste and like be intentional with what I'm actually purchasing? So the number one thing that everybody can do that is really simple is avoid the food that is going to be wasted from ever coming into your home. So that requires meal planning. And this can be so simple. You do not need a fancy app. You don't need a cookbook. You really don't need anything other than a piece of paper and a pen. And what I like to do is just write down like Monday to Friday, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you're not a huge planner, you can leave this really loose, but write down maybe three meals that you would probably like to cook in the week. I like to write down, okay, I'm going to make overnight oats, maybe a pasta on Wednesday. I'll have the leftovers for lunch on Thursday. Then once you make this list, you're going to create a shopping list based on your meal plan, which I hope took you about 10 minutes. And once you make a shopping list, you're not heading to the grocery store yet. You're going to look in your fridge and pantry because so often we're double buying because again, we're just like speeding around the house like crazy people and then into the grocery stores. So shop your fridge and pantry, see wh what items you already have on hand or what items are needing to be used up and then head to the grocery store with your list. Try not to get distracted and buy random things. And when you come back, one really good tip is to do a little bit of meal prep. So if you can prep things, uh, maybe slice up your bell peppers, create sauces, make the cooking easier for you during the week. And there's a huge conversation here to be had about food waste and health, because I think if, if we're going to be intentionally reducing our food waste, I really think that requires meal planning. And if you start meal planning and you start cooking the food that you're buying, you're ultimately going to start eating healthier, which is awesome too. It's like a win, win, win. Then uh, once you get the food home, a lot of it comes down to food storage, right? So one big one I see a lot of people waste is their spinach. So they'll get, they'll buy a well-intentioned box of spinach. They're like, I'm going to have spinach smoothies or salads all week and I mean I've done it myself and then the spinach slowly is staring at you every day at the back of the fridge and to keep it longer I recommend putting a paper towel or clean cloth to absorb some of the moisture and then don't wash it until you're actually going to eat it 
And then additionally, if you do get to a point where that spinach is wilting, there's so much you can do with it. So you can put it in freezer bags, you can blend it up with some coconut water and then freeze in ice cubes so you have like spinach bombs to go in your smoothies. Another big one is herbs. People have a real problem with cilantro, it seems. So you can store that like a bouquet in your fridge, or you can also wrap in a moist paper towel to keep it fresh. Uh, celery and carrots you can chop and store in water to keep them nice. And you can bring celery and carrots back to life too when they go limp. As long as there's no signs of spoilage or mold, you can, uh, you can soak them in water. Uh, iceberg lettuce as well that's a that's a good trick potatoes you want to keep in a dry cool place like a cellar or a garage and once you learn how to store food I think I have a whole section for this in my book you can also just google it but once you learn how to store food it can last considerably longer but when in doubt before you see mold and you think like oh I'm not gonna get to this bread is a big one bread is the number one wasted food in the world uh freeze it for your freezer is your best friend. And one thing I want to say about frozen food too is there's this misconception that when you're buying frozen that it's somehow unhealthier than not as healthy. Yeah, than fresh. Yeah. And in reality, frozen berries is a great example of this. And I live in Canada where the food is often like all of our berries are from Mexico. So you think about how many days it took for the berries to get here. And the frozen berries have actually been harvested and then frozen almost immediately. So oftentimes they'll be more nutrient dense than the fresh. Then if you're buying frozen berries, you're taking the guilt away because you know they're just as healthy, if not more nutrient dense than the fresh. You're going to have a lot longer life to them, more use for them in your smoothies or whichever else that you're making. So freezer's your best friend, food storage, meal planning, that is going to get you that's like the low hanging fruit for lack of a better term that is going to get you 90% there to reducing your food waste. I love all of those. I was literally writing down the things that I do when I am responsible about it that help. I think one of them is having like a well-stocked pantry. It's like, it's so helpful when you don't know what to cook and you're just like, okay, I need to go out and buy stuff. No, if you have a well-stocked pantry, you can make almost anything. Um, the other thing I really try to do is I, I am less planning than I probably should be, but I do the like, oh, this is about to go bad, so I'm using it tonight. Like if I have cauliflower that I know is about to go bad, it's like, okay, I'm making cauliflower tacos or I'm making cauliflower with some sort of like spread, like a harissa hummus situation on the bottom. Um, Thank you. I very, I'll make it for you sometime. Um, The other thing that I got caught up in, especially in my early 20s, um, I'm from Seattle. We're a Costco, like Costco runs in our blood here in the Pacific Northwest. Like if Costco called me and they're like, I, I, we need a kidney. I'd be like, which one? Like I love Costco more than anything, but I was a single woman shopping at Costco and buying things in bulk. And I still do this sometimes. I literally, I got an Instacart thing from Costco this weekend and I bought a, literally I bought a bag of carrots. If you're watching on YouTube, that was this big. It was like this, this long, this big, massive. So now I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to use all of these things? So I think there are some things if you're cooking for one or even cooking for two that Costco is really helpful for like their toilet paper and their rotisserie chickens. But like, I, I can't use as many carrots as I'm trying to buy in this period of time. So yeah, I'm either freezing them, which I love that, or I'm just thinking strategically about when to buy them. And then the other thing I wrote down that I need to be better about, but when I do, speaking of the carrots, is like cutting things to make them ready to eat. Because something about like looking at a whole carrot with all of its hair and the tips, I'm just like, no, I don't want to eat that. But like, I'm a little child. I'm a fucking child. If I cut that up and it looks like baby carrots right off the get go, like I'm going to eat it. So that's a couple of the things I love to do or that I've hacked my way. Yeah, that ties right into this health conversation that we're talking about too, is that like, right, if you're going to be intentional about your food waste, you're going to find you probably are automatically eating healthier if you're making the prepping that food. And when I worked a regular nine to five back at the hospital, I was huge into meal prepping. And this isn't for everyone, but I would really like make it. I'm huge into soups and stews. Canadian weather, horrible. So it's like eight months of the year, it's soup season. And I would make a huge batch batch of soup and throw every vegetable known to man in there on a Sunday. And then I would have it like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, sometimes even Thursday. So once you actually take the time to prep 
the ingredients that you buy they're just so much more consumable and you're less likely to like fly through the drive through on the way to work when you have something prepped or reach for you know i love chips i'll continue to eat chips but like if my carrots are cut i'm most likely to yeah. reach for them or if my berries have been like washed and opened like i'm more likely to reach for those as a snack rather than my takis for the seventh time this week so <laughs> yeah one of the things I'm really excited to talk with you about, and it's going to take a little bit of backstory to get into it, but I think that you'll really appreciate. Um, I was a very similar to you. I was the chicken tenders, tater tots. Well, for me, it was chicken tenders. It was that was the version of like my uh, that's all I can cook. I just throw them in the oven. And then I made I, it was a lot of the people I dated, like a lot of the men I dated either had like culinary backgrounds or like were really good home chefs. My friends were good chefs. And so I started learning a lot. And then I watched way too much Food Network. So I got to the point where like, I like to think I'm a pretty fucking good cook. And I have uh, my partner now um, was the very much like I cook for sustenance. It doesn't really need to taste good. It just needs to happen. And so over the past two years of us dating, there's been a really cool version of him where, you know, he is learning how to cook. He's he's learning all of the things on Food Network where he's like, oh, I know how to do that. Or this is a thing that I know now. And the one thing that we that I feel like it, it it's the the barrier to entry here is he will bring out a cookbook and he'll look at the recipe and he'll follow it to an absolute T. And I used to do this early in my days too. And I would get mad at people in my life who didn't follow the recipe because I'm like, no, the recipe says this, we need to use this. But what often happens is any sort of recipe book I get, I won't have that certain ingredient. And rather than feeling like, oh, I need to go out and buy this thing that I'm maybe only going to use once or that just an extra trip to the grocery store, I end up subbing it for something else. Or I, you know, don't measure my spices exactly because I know what things should taste like. So I really wanted your perspective as someone who is a cookbook writer, but also committed to scrappy cooking. How can people think about recipes in a more flexible way? Understanding that you can make something without 100% following the recipe, especially considering that like vegetable substitution is actually really easy with a lot of things. I love this question because it really speaks to kind of my mission, which is to really empower people to learn to cook and then have the flexibility to use up the food they have in their fridge. And it's actually how I designed my new cookbook is I have probably about 25 recipes that are earmarked as kitchen raid recipes, and they are identical to what you're talking about, where you can flex in whatever vegetables you have in your fridge. So as opposed to calling for like one bell pepper, it will say like one cup of chopped vegetables. I used X, Y, and Z. You could use blah, 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 or whatever you have on hand. And so if somebody's listening and they're new to cooking, I know from being a recipe creator that I get questions, probably so many messages every day asking if they can make substitutions in recipes. And oftentimes they'll be like, can I sub sweet potato for butternut squash? And I'm like, 100%. So I will say in my career, 99% of the people that ask this question, the answer is yes, when it's a substitution for a vegetable. And you want to look at like vegetables that are similar. So like a butternut squash and a sweet potato and a yellow potato, they all have like a similar texture. They're going to go great in whatever you're making. And it kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier. I think plant-based cooking is a really great way to kind of enter into this realm of learning how to become an intuitive cook because the stakes are so low. Like really, you're dealing with plants. You're not going to probably overcook them to the point where you're, you won't be able to consume it. You're probably not going to undercook it to the point where you can't consume it. It's really easy to play around and get, get fun. And I think that so much of it comes from just like you said, your partner. It's like we take it too seriously and we're looking at it so literally, but we need to have fun with it. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be enjoyable. And I really find often cooking, once you get in the flow of it, and you might relate to this, can be therapeutic. When you're like in a in a real flow with it and you're tasting things like I cook things just way. when I need a break. I like I need the meditation of cooking. I will do this often as I will break my work because I'm just like, I'm so stressed and I will go cook something 100%. Exactly. 
it's almost a mindfulness activity where you're like, okay, I'm chopping some vegetables. I'm not thinking about X, Y, and Z at what's going on at work. And I encourage people to taste their food along the way, find out what they like, add a little more salt, add a little more chili powder, whatever you're making, and uh, it'll be okay. You you can always fix it when you're cooking plant-based. So it's supposed to be fun. Take the, <laughs> take the, uh, take the, the, rigidness out of it is really what you need to start by doing. Yeah, let's talk about seasoning for a second, because this is the number one thing that I, I think I see. And the number one thing I had to learn is how to properly season my food. I think the average listener of this show is obviously progressive. They probably know the vegetables are good. We don't need to convince them that pl plant based diet is a good thing. But I do think there is this misconception uh, that again is rapidly changing, but that like vegetables don't taste good. And I'm like, no, you're just not seasoning them properly or not cooking them properly. I love my mom. I grew up in a like steamed cauliflower household or like so steamed I. broccoli. Yeah. I, and I never ate a vegetable growing up. And I look back and I think definitely it was partially because I was a picky eater, but partially like I remember the first time I tasted like charred Brussels sprouts for the first time. And I'm like, these are fucking incredible. Where have these been all my life? So let's talk maybe about seasoning, but also like the heat of like the importance of like char or cooking something in a certain way. It really comes down to those components of uh, salt, fat, acid, heat, right? And I, I am a huge seasoner. Like I, even when I'm writing my cookbook recipes, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm adding like four tablespoons of nutritional yeast to these Brussels sprouts. And I'm like, people are going to think this is nuts, but it just adds so much flavor and deliciousness and also health benefits when you're w really seasoning your food. So y there's elements here, right? You talk about char, like if you cook something like potatoes, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and you really roast them and add some oil and, and char them, they're going to, the flavor almost caramelizes, comes, comes out, and it makes them 10 times more delicious. Almost as delicious as like a potato chip when you have like a Brussels sprout that is really, really crisp. And then I love to add acid in terms of all often um, coat some vegetables in like a little bit of apple cider vinegar. I love a balsamic glaze. So that's a really great way to enhance flavor of your vegetables. I have a great recipe where you roast a cabbage steak and then you finish it off with balsamic glaze. Just delicious. And then we'll talk about fat. So oils, a peanut butter, uh, almond butter, tahini, making dressings with uh, with fatty ingredients is really going to add a, a nice balance when you have something that is very like kale is a great example. Everybody tells me they hate kale, but I love kale. And the truth is it really comes down to like that acid and fat. You want to um, add a little lemon juice and massage it in and then either a fatty dressing, not a fatty dressing, but like a tahini dressing, which has some fat right. content or avocado to kind of balance out that crisp, crispness, crisp. Ness. And then finally, we do talk about salt seasonings. So I find a lot of people undersalt their food, but this is highly personal. There's a lot of people in the whole food plant based community who are SOS free. So this is salt, oil, and something else. But when you don't eat salt, your palate is going to be very specific. If you try something salty, it's going to seem like so salty, right? So I do find that people are so specific about their salt. Like I'll get comments from my first book that some recipes are too salty and then another person will say not enough salt. So I think it's a very personal thing. And this goes back to really being customizable with your recipes, trying the food and salting and seasoning to your liking is a huge thing. And, and stocking your seasoning cupboard, I think, is a, is a great way to start. We did a previous episode on the show, and it's called How to Be a Better Cook. And I talk mm -hmm. about what I've learned, and I literally am just yelling at people. I'm like, salt your goddamn food. Because yeah. I, I don't know how you feel in Canada, but in the US, it's like salt is a bad thing. And I'm like, no, again, you watch any cooking show, and they take First of all, you have a salt well, which is another tip I have, which is like, don't keep your salt in a shaker, actually t physically touch your salt. You know how much there is. And then you just watch them just, it's, it's so much salt and it makes it taste better. And it's like, you're going to have a better time. 
Like even even you'll find chocolate desserts. Like you Oh. you'll find it tastes a little flat. You add a little bit of salt, and suddenly Flaky that salt. sweetness. Yeah, suddenly the sweetness is dancing. So salt is a huge one. And I would say even if you you break out a cookbook and you try a recipe and you get it on the table and you're like, eh, add a little bit of salt. It <laughs> it might be the game changer that you're looking for. Yep. Or as yeah, to your point about acid, the little the little squeeze of lemon juice too. Yeah. Speaking of my partner, I don't mean to roast him, pun intended, this badly. <laughs> this episode, he's a great cook. He's getting better. But he made a cabbage soup like a month ago. And he's like, yeah, like it had a bunch of good stuff in it, but there's just like something missing. And I was like, bring it to me. And I basically doctored it and I tasted it. And I was like, oh, this needs acid. And like, I just put red wine vinegar in it. And then I'm Yeah. trying to remember, I think I added like garlic powder and that's all I added and it immediately tasted better. So it's like, I think it is to your point, tasting your food. And it is those four components. I've preached it before and she actually follows me. She just started following us a couple of weeks ago. So me and over at self at acid heat and I like had a meltdown So cool. because I love her. But yeah, it's the four elements. If you like something's missing, figure out, is it, is it not salted enough? Have I not charred it? with the heat. Yeah. Do I need more acid? Do I need some fat? Yeah. You're exactly right. You're making me I, hungry now. I know. Truly. I just had this moment too. <laughs> you can probably hear it if you really listened. Like there's, I'm like salivating now at this point. <laughs> Let's go back to, you were mentioning like a lot of the things that, you know, we love to cook and that are really healthy for us are also the most expensive, like the groceries that are the most expensive are fruits and vegetables and fresh things. So yes, I think we can get them frozen. I think that's a great way to, you know, cut down on the cost. But I guess we live in a society where the cheap things are not the most healthy things. So can we talk maybe more about that barrier that a lot of people have to healthy food just because they can't afford it? It's really tough. I am not going to sit here and say that eating like a whole food plant based diet is is going to be cheap, right? I don't think heading to the grocery store and eating healthy period. I mean, I've heard from friends that meat and dairy are just astronomical themselves. I do think that stripping things down to really basic things can be helpful. So I'm talking about canned beans, going around the vegetable section in your grocery store and seeing what's in season and what it what is on sale and building kind of meal components from that can be a really effective way of building healthy meals that are calorically dense rice pasta grains bread then building out going zipping through your vegetable aisles and seeing what you can combine i think one thing that I really encourage people to do in their households and it kind of ties into being building more affordable meals but we have in this household what I like to call like staple meals so we'll make every single week I make probably some sort of curry and I make some sort of pasta sauce and I make some sort of soup and they'll contain different things every week but they're in my repertoire where I'm cycling through them as a base recipe so a great example would be like I'm obsessed with red curry So I'll always be making like red curry with coconut milk, a little bit of ginger, whichever else. So if you have these meals that you love in your household, I think stocking your pantry with like those base items and then just cycling the vegetables or the protein that's on sale. If you are, are a meat eater, it's great to look at what protein's on sale that week and cycling them into these base meals and knowing you already have the foundations maybe at home from buying something in bulk can be a good way to save money. But there's no way around this conversation without acknowledging that it's not it's not clear cut and it's not easy and in terms of solving food insecurity i mean that's such a it it's kind of to your point earlier like an onion because oftentimes the the issue is is that people live in food deserts and literally just don't even have access to fresh food or the education to know how to cook it yeah when we talk about you know food deserts uh, our research we, it's 34 million households in the us are are astonishing food insecure Yeah. So it's just crazy. And I mean, is there help or hope for people who want this access to whole foods, but are often forced by necessity to eat more processed? I mean, you were talking about this. Is is there certain like processed foods that are like less bad or like, are there, are there ways that we can, I mean, you kind of already touched on this, but like thinking about like, okay, I can't eat a hundred percent whole food diet. Are there ways that we can combine fresh ingredients with slightly less worse things, if that makes sense? Yeah, I love to like call this up leveling 
food. So a great example would be if you're someone who likes craft dinner and a box of craft dinner might be affordable or alfagetti, adding like frozen peas, which are an excellent source of protein, fiber, nutrients, and they're typically really affordable in comparison to other vegetables. A adding a adding a whole thing of frozen peas you could add some tofu tofu is typically a pretty affordable protein and right now you've up leveled what would typically be considered like a low nutrient dense meal and made it nutrient dense so that could be also applied to like you get the cheapest pasta you can get from the grocery store dry pasta and a canned sauce and again up leveling it with whatever vegetables you can add to it. What I love to do sometimes is add a bunch of vegetables to a food processor. This is another hack for reducing waste, but carrots, bell peppers, onion, garlic, whatever you have, even frozen vegetables and making it into a veggie ground, sauteing that with a little oil in your pan and then adding just a jarred pasta sauce and putting it over noodles can be a great way. So thinking about how you can not take away these processed foods that can be staples in people's diets who can't necessarily afford, but add where you can affordable plant-based or whole food substitutes. The other side of this conversation is there is a stigma that eating vegan is expensive. And I mean, I, I'm not surprised when you head into like Air One and they've got like a Haley Bieber smoothie for $18. Like it's insane. But um, in some ways, a whole food plant-based diet can be more affordable than eating some processed foods. So like a great example is I see so many people who go vegan and then they're just buying one-to-one -one replacements. So they're going in and they, they used to eat beef. So they're now buying Beyond Meat or Impossible Meat for like $10 for one like small package. Or they're buying vegan chicken fingers, which are extremely expensive for the amount of food that you're getting. So I would encourage people from both a health perspective and a financial perspective to really lean into whole foods if they're available and accessible to you so like rather than buying ground beef buy lentils you can buy a huge thing of lentils for like a couple of dollars soak your lentils and add that to your pasta sauce as opposed to like an impossible meat and you're going to benefit from a health perspective there too so if we strip it down to whole foods it can be somewhat affordable and i say that with knowing that that comes from a from a place of privilege as well yeah one of the things i did not necessarily because um i was trying to be more vegan but because i was trying to be healthier and also i didn't know how to cook was i would take a frozen pizza and then just chop up a bunch of spinach and then i love top that. It. that 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 was my easy hack was what's like i wanted pizza i wanted to be slightly healthier so i took my fresh spinach and i just threw it on there and i'll still do that sometimes i actually do that a lot i'll take my trader joe's like chicken tikka masala and then throw in some sort of leafy green on top to make it healthier. Yep. You mentioned the privilege of being vegan. You had an episode on your podcast where you talked about white veganism. Can you share a little bit about that topic? And yeah, just like, let's talk about that privilege of being vegan. Yes. So when you hear the term vegan, what comes to mind, right? And it's probably a white woman in California. And I mean, I am not helping my own case here as I talk on this podcast. It's, it's Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> it's I, Gwyneth am, Paltrow. I am Canadian, but I am a, I am a white vegan woman, right? And that's been yeah. the representation. When we think about veganism, it's kind of this like Gwyneth Paltrow um, fad, like super healthy hippie diet when in reality a lot of the origins of people who have eaten vegan for centuries come rich in culture so indian culture african-american um there there are so many vegan recipes and staple ingredients in in these people's diets that are vegan so i think it, it's difficult because the problem is then people who are growing up and they are, say, African-American, don't see the representation of themselves in someone that is vegan. So they're, they're perhaps less likely to go that way, which is unfortunate because it can be such a healthful, nutrient-dense, and in some 
in some cases, more affordable diet. So what is the solution to this? I think it's just amplifying voices in the plant-based and vegan space who are of different colors. I tried to do this on my platform myself, try to call in people and making sure that they get the platforms to have the representation. And then from a media perspective, right, it's it's commercials with vegan products having having different representation in them. Um, can start to tackle this issue and unravel it and really talking about so there's so many wonderful creators online um, that do this but talk about the origins of their food from when they're making vegan meals from different from different cultures I think it's it's just so wonderful and I think part of this is the beauty of social media now is that really anybody can can cook online and become a creator and and showcase their recipes and recipes that have been passed down through culture and it's a wonderful thing to see because i think that it does hopefully start to even out that that representation as time goes on yeah i love that and you're exactly right i'm th you're thinking about indian dishes like a huge chunk of that is either vegetarian or vegan and like that's a staple of indian cooking is yeah, you're so right. Um, I want to talk to you about, the, you, you mentioned this before, but the creation of a cookbook. I've, I've written a book. I won't shut up about it. I, but like there is, there's so much difference between, a, well, first of all, a novel and nonfiction. That's a whole other thing. But like, I'm thinking about a cookbook where it's like, okay, you got to do photo shoots. You got to test recipes, but also you have to think about like, not only how you what the recipe looks like and what's in the ingredients, but how you present it in terms of education and shameless plug for your book. I literally, I got a copy yesterday. It's like, it's so truly so beautiful and like shows you every single ingredient. And then to your point shows you substitutions. And like, you can tell that you definitely thought about not just how do we make something that tastes good, but how do I actually teach somebody how to do this? So I would just love to hear your perspective of like, what goes into actually writing a cookbook? so much work yeah i just know yourself <laughs> books are just like mammoth like mammoth amount of work i wrote my first one i remember i had signed the deal and the next day i went out and bought a camera i had been shooting everything on my iphone up until that point and it was like really my first one was a crash course in writing cookbooks because i wrote the whole thing shot the whole thing by myself and it was brutal um i think it took me about a year and, and I want to pause you there for a second. Most people hire food stylists. Yes. If you write a cookbook, most people don't style the food themselves. It sounds like you did it yourself, which is even more work. I did. And um, <laughs> I didn't have the money at the time. Like I did not have the money at the time to hire out. And I was like, I can do this. It's like that thing. How, how hard can it be? Boys do it. <laughs> but uh, I, I did it. And it was just a mammoth, a mammoth amount of work. So I really, my first cookbook, I thought a lot about what is the cookbook that I needed when I first went plant-based. And really, like, I had to sacrifice this idea of it being, like, this really beautiful kind of image stylized cookbook because I wanted these infographics which I've carried through both of my books where I have the ingredients on the top and then the finished dish on the bottom and if anybody is watching on YouTube I'm going to show what I mean by that because I feel like it doesn't necessarily make sense there's there was my book um and later on I, I had published it and it was so interesting because I kept getting messages from people who were neurodivergent as well as parents with kids who absolutely love the book and then also just general public. But later on, I was diagnosed with ADHD and I was like, this makes so much sense because for some reason, my brain computes this format of my cookbook in, in just a much simpler way to cook. And so many people have said that to me. So I carried it forward to my second one, but it, it, it is a lot of work. And I, I took all of the images for my first book of the individual ingredients as well. Nightmare. Um, my second, fast forward, I was able to build a team around me. Amazing photographer. What a, what a godsend that was to have somebody taking the photos and be able to spend more time actually recipe testing. My sister actually left her job and assisted me. I, I hired her full time to work on the book. So I had help this time, 
which was wonderful, but it was still, still a ton of work, man. It is, uh, it's a, usually a two year process. So you usually write for around nine months and then two, like two to three rounds of edits, all of the photos, the lifestyle shoots. And then as you know, um, yourself, because I know you did so much work to promote your book, the promotion is like half the battle because then you're yep. going on podcasts, you're you're hiring PR, you're trying to get on TV and all of that jazz. And then it never ends because you still want the book to be a success after that first week. Everybody write a book. You got it. It's so yep. much fun. <laughs> No, I literally, I tell people all the time, people ask me all the time, should I write a book? And I'm like, honestly, no. <laughs> like, no, you've got to really want it. you got to really want it bad. Yeah. So this is our nice way of saying, and we'll give her a plug at the end. Buy her book. God damn it. It's Thank great. You. Um, I would love to do a little bit of a rapid fire with you and give you a ingredient that is scrappy or something left over and tell me what I should make with it. So coffee grounds. Coffee grounds. I love to add a few tablespoons of spent coffee grounds. So after you've made your coffee to make a chocolate granola. So you just add oats, cocoa powder, a little bit of tahini and some of those coffee grounds. Mix it up, roast it in the oven. It makes the most delicious like mocha flavored granola. Another thing you can do with coffee grounds, pop them in your fridge in a bowl and they'll actually be a natural deodorizer because they suck up things. You know, people put baking soda in their bowl and then number I've got bacon soda. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then number three is you can use it as a plant fertilizer, but I am not a green thumb. I've been told it works amazing for some plants and not so good for others. So please do a little Google search before you start putting it in your plants and then DMing me and saying it killed <laughs> it killed my lily. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> You managed to bring up my two favorite things in this world, which is cooking and plants in the same conversation. Yeah. Um, as someone who does keep plants alive pretty well. Yeah. You're exactly right. Sometimes it works great. Sometimes it does not work. Um, oh, and I should have said this before. Almost every idea you're going to give me, I may have, uh, doctored this game a little bit is all recipes that are in your okay. cookbook. So, um, vegetable scraps like the insides of peppers or cauliflower, like the leftover leaves of cauliflower. What do I do with veggie scraps? So biggest cooking tip. This is great. If you're wanting to reduce waste and I actually learned this from watching Rachel Ray's 30 minute meals I always when I'm cooking have a bowl next to me where I'm collecting my food scraps and then what I do with them is put them in a freezer bag collect them over time once that's full you're going to transfer to a big pot add a bunch of water I like to add turmeric and black pepper extra health benefits and a nice little yellow color and you're going to make your own nutrient dense scrappy broth which I like to call like a vegan bone broth because it really is so nutrient and dense from those like skins of onions and cauliflower leaves and all that good stuff. I do the same thing. We had our camera switch. This is what happens is my good camera decides eventually to, it's just tired and it stops working. Um, no, I do the same thing. I yep, keep a freezer bag in my in my freezer. And then just when I'm chopping vegetables, that's where the scraps go. Uh, the other thing, um, if you are not vegan that I like to do, and this is a little crazy, but if I am at a restaurant where I am either ordering like mussels or I am ordering a steak and it comes with the bone, I will take the bone to go um, and I will put it in a to go container and that becomes that goes in my broth. Um, and it, you're real scrappy. It's really scrappy. But you. it's like typically if I, you know, I like to eat good food and it's a good restaurant they've been cooking that thing forever with a bunch of seasoning and it's going to really, it's going to add to a broth. So yeah, I've done that a couple of times where I'm like, hi, actually, can I, can I get it to go box? And then I just take all the muscle shells or I take the clam shells or yeah, if my like meat comes on a bone, a lamb chop or a, like I will take the, the leftover parts of that and I will put it in the broth. <laughs> Genius. That's, a, that's amazing. It's maybe too obsessive, but that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> carrot tops. I have some carrot tops literally in my fridge. What should we do with those? Carrot tops. I love to make a carrot top chimichurri. So this is just blending with some balsamic vinegar and some spices, and you can use it to season for tacos. You can also take carrot tops and make a pesto. So I have something called a scrappy pesto in my book. So you add any greens and you add them with like cashews, nutritional yeast, and blend them up with some garlic so good such a good sauce yep i was planning on pesto so i love that lemon peels oh so good uh, lemon peels have like a million uses but this is actually my favorite recipe in my new book lemon peel pesto so i like to take a potato peeler to avoid some of the pith 
but you can peel your lemon peels and then again blend them with like cashews, garlic, nutritional yeast to make this beautiful, luscious, almost like a vegan Alfredo sauce. If you're someone who loves citrus, this is very lemony. And then uh, add it with your favorite pasta or even use it as a dip. Citrus peels are also great, whether you're using lemons, limes, orange peels, you can candy them and they'll become like uh, almost like gummy worms. And it's okay when you're candying them if they do like have a bit of that pith so you can use the whole the whole peel because it's like kind of like a sweet bitter deliciousness that happens and uh yeah it's really good this is not directly cooking so you might not know anything about this so tell me if you don't but like i've heard that you can use them to clean things yes. i don't know how this works okay oh, i i <laughs> i do this so you add your lemon peels and like your squeezed lemons to a container um a spray bottle and then you add vinegar and you let them soak mm -hmm. and then after a couple of days you just drain the lemons and you can clean your your surfaces with that but you have to be careful i believe it might be quartz where it can wear down the surface. So again, Google's your best friend, but it, it makes an excellent and like has such a nice scent to it for cleaning yeah. and great way to repurpose your lemon scraps. And that's one of the only things I actually won't compost either. And I'll purposely put them in the garbage disposal so they that so the garbage good. disposal doesn't get stinky. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, one of my favorites, and I love, I think I learned this from you, a jar of like barely there Dijon mustard or peanut butter. Yes, I love bottom of the jar recipes, I like to call them. So Dijon mustard, once I get to the bottom of the jar, I like to add vinegar, olive oil, salt, black pepper, and shake it up, lemon juice too, to make a beautiful, luscious like mustard dressing. Peanut butter, similar idea. Um, this is one of my most viral videos, which it's so funny, and I'm sure you've experienced this. You put something up, and you almost didn't post it because you're like, this is kind of lame. But I made a peanut sauce out of an almost empty peanut jar. So just you have your almost empty jar. You add like some soy sauce, hoisin sauce, a little bit of rice vinegar. Give it a really good shake, and now you have a delicious peanut sauce that you've added new life to that jar that would have otherwise been thrown out. And you've got the like mechanism to make it right there too because to your point you just put the lid on it you shake it yeah and it always drives me crazy i can never get i know there's more in there but i can never get it with my knife to actually use it for its intended purpose yeah okay i saved the best for last slightly stale bread talk to me slightly stale bread so again bread the number one most wasted food which is so shocking because how much do all of us love bread but the problem is i think we buy it from a bakery and then it goes hard really quickly so what you want to do with stale bread is i have an amazing vegan french toast casserole you just break up that kind of hard bread put it into a casserole dish make a beautiful like custard out of vegan yogurt plant-based milk and pour it over top and then and pop it in the oven and that bread will suck up the moisture become absolutely luscious and delicious almost like french toast when in doubt breadcrumbs so you can uh or croutons you can bake your bread into croutons for your salad or you can blend them up with some spices to make some delicious breadcrumbs which you can use for like a million different things put it on the top of soup. Yeah. I literally, I just did this for the first time, like last month. I do bag salads. I'm a bag salad girly. I love them. They're convenient. They're great. And I made my own croutons as opposed to using theirs. It was night and day. It was like, yeah, olive oil, salt, pep, bunch of garlic powder in the air fryer. It was one of the best things I've ever tasted. I was just like, Amazing. great. Why am I not doing this the entire time? Um, I am just blown away by you. I love having this conversation. Um, I love your work so much. You have a new book called Scrappy Cooking. Tell us more about it. Yeah, so Scrappy Cooking has over 150 delicious whole food, plant-based, zero waste recipes, just like what we talked about today. Lots of kitchen raid recipes where you can interchange the ingredients and it is out everywhere books are sold. Thank you so much for having me on. This was a blast and your admiration of my content is like, I feel that way 10 times about you. I just think the work you're doing is so powerful and so important. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please follow her on Instagram too and TikTok if you haven't already. I've yeah learned a lot from you and it's just, yeah, so excited to continue reading your book and gonna make a recipe this week. So Yay. thanks for being here. Thank you.